So, let's talk about electric potential, and usually I have to say the title a few times just to get your attention, but electric potential. This is where we're going. Before we get to our destination, which is electric potential, I want to talk about electric potential energy. Now, I've already written it on the blackboard, but I want to make sure that it's in writing on the video. So force versus energy for charge versus mass. Oh, it's V is for voltage, but voltage is kind of like a slang for electric potential. So force and potential energy. So here's the analogy. If we're talking about gravity versus electric charge, we know that for gravity, the force equation, equation in general, the universal uh, law of gravitation is F equals G, M1, M2 over R squared. And we've talked previously about the fact that the elect I'm sorry, the gravitational potential energy between two massive objects is G, M1, M2 over R. So on the blackboard, before we started the video, we said that analogously, the force that we've talked about previously for electrostatics is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And as a pattern, by the same method of derivation, E is equal to K Q1 Q2 over R. So this is just for the benefit of the people that are absent today, and there's a couple of people that are absent today. Um, sorry on the blackboard though. Yeah? Which one was just K Q1 over R? K Q1 over R uh, was the electric field intensity. And actually, that's a good point. Because, shh, catch this please. Uh, that's a good point Daniel brings up. We're saying that E is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R, but previously we said that E was equal, equal to KQ over R. So how can we have E be equal to the same thing? Well, this is E for what? E is for energy, electric potential energy. Previously, we talked about E as an electric, uh, as an electric field, and so people make the distinction often by writing it as a curly E. See that curly E that's up on the screen? and they put an arrow over top of it just to indicate that it's a, an electric field. So just to be double sure, if you didn't catch that the E was curly, it's also got an arrow. Okay, so that's the distinction people usually make symbolically, and it doesn't always translate nicely in, in textbooks, and uh, you know, it's, it's good to make the point at this point. So from now on, I'm gonna do electric fields as a curly E with an arrow over top so that we don't get confused between electric field and electric potential energy. All right. So if I move charges, just like if I move mass, let's say that we start with a positive charge here, and we can call it a point charge, so just a point charge, and I have another charge right here, I can call it a test charge. If I knew the distance between them, and if I knew the quantity of the charge, in coulombs, I could figure out what the force would be between these two guys. But now I could also calculate what the electric potential energy is. And if I could calculate the electric potential energy between these two, then I suppose if I let go of them and let all that electric potential energy be converted into some other viewable form of energy, like kinetic energy, then I could figure out what the total kinetic energy of the system would be if I were to release them and all that electric potential energy were allowed to turn into kinetic energy. Now. If I did release these two, they're being fixed in place right now, but if I did, if I did release these two, what would happen to them? Yeah, yeah they'd, according to the force equation, we know that they'd get pushed outwards. And so eventually they'd give up all their electric potential energy and gain kinetic energy that's equal to electric potential energy. Uh, Q point and Q test. Not a very good T. All right. <coughs> So here's another little bit. If a charge 
is moved to a new distance or a different distance <clears throat> away from a point from another point charge it will involve work okay it'll involve work it'll either mean that the one charge is doing work on another charge or we're doing work on the one charge to get things closer okay so if i start it with the the test charge being over here, and I have this big point charge over here, and I move this big test charge closer, let's say that we start off at a distance Ra apart, and I move it so that the charge is now at a new position, we can say Rb apart, I must have had to apply a force to get it there. Maybe it was a uniform force, maybe it wasn't a uniform force, I don't really want to talk about that. I mean seems like maybe the, the force that I'd be applying would vary if I wanted to move it at a constant speed, but that's kind of irrelevant. All I know is that when I do work on something, it's the same as saying I've changed the amount of energy that it has. Okay? Delta E is equal to work. So if I want to know how much work was done on this positive charge to move it from this distance to some closer distance, or actually even some farther distance, but some distance, new distance relative to the, the uh, point charge, I could say that delta E here would be, well, E2 minus E1, where E2 would be KQ1, Q2 over R, well, R A or R B? <coughs> what do you think for the E2? R B, yeah. Okay. Minus K Q1, Q2 over RA. And you know, maybe there's somebody out there that would want to factor out the KQ1, Q2 out front and turn it into a sort of an ugly binomial, which would be KQ1, Q2 times 1 over RB minus 1 over RA. Maybe figure out how much work would have to be done to move from that position to a new position. Okay. Position A to position B. Now likewise, if I started it at position B and then let it go, and you know, you just told me that they were positive. So you know that this, if I kept um, the red charge stationary, let's say it's relatively a very massive charge and it's not really able to go very far. Okay, so maybe this is um, something that's sitting in a nucleus, relatively stationary, stuck in a, a lattice crystal or something like that. If I let this charge go and at some later time we found it to be here, we could figure out how much work the electric field had done on it which would mean that I could figure out probably something about its kinetic energy because that's how much electric potential energy would have been given to this thing and transformed into kinetic energy. Okay. Oh, can I take this away? <coughs> yeah? All right. So what we say is Electric potential energy, and I'm going to do it as a subscript E. Please don't get E for electric mixed up with E for elastic. I'm trying to use E for electric. Is equal to work. <coughs> and we said previously that, sorry, <coughs> force is equal to KQ1 <coughs> Q2 over R squared, what would happen if I, well, what would happen if I divided the force by uh, Q test? What would, I, what would I get? Yeah, so if I said F over Q test, where Q2 is equal to the Q test, I would say that this would be equal to KQ1 over R squared. And what we said yesterday was, wh what's that one equal to? Is that equal to anything? 
Yeah, it's the amount of newtons per coulomb that would be applied to something, right? Okay. Is that right? What did we call that yesterday? Do you remember? Yeah, it was electric field intensity. Okay. So that's something that we've said previously. What if I did something similar with the electric potential energy? If I did electric potential energy is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R. So this is the amount of newtons that it gets exerted on something in an electric field per coulomb of that charge that's sitting in that electric field. That's what that means. If there's five coulombs of something in a five, five uh, newton per coulomb field, then you end up getting 25 newtons pushing on that thing. But this is electric potential energy. What if I take electric potential energy and divide it by the test charge, where Q2 is the test charge? Then I get E over Q test equals KQ1 over R. What does that mean? I want to look at the, the units. I know that energy is measured in joules. And I know that Q is measured in coulombs. Joules per coulomb. What does that mean? It's kind of a, a little bit of a, an abstract thing to think about. I know that this kind of means that for every one coulomb of charge that's sitting there, there'd be a certain amount of force acting on it in that electric field. For this one, for every one coulomb of charge that's sitting near another charge, it has so many joules of electric potential energy, depending on how close it is to that charge. OK? That's kind of a, a different way of thinking about stuff. How much energy does something have per coulomb of stuff that's there? And you never really talk about that when you're talking about gravity, although we could. Because if we can do this for this form of the equation, we could also do it for the analogous equation for electric potential energy for gravity. We could say that for gravity, EG is equal to G M1 M2 over R. And I could divide both sides by M, or M2. And you'd end up saying, oh, OK, so EG over M2 is equal to G M1 over R. And that would have units of joules per kilogram. And you know, there, there really is a use for that. If I talked about how many joules per kilogram something has when it's elevated above the Earth. If you have, I don't know, like 50 joules per kilogram at some point above the Earth's surface, so here's the Earth's surface, and you're sitting up here, and somebody calculates that you have 50 joules per kilogram. If I have one kilogram of stuff there, how many joules of potential energy would I have? If I had 100 joules of stuff there, I mean, kilograms of stuff there. How many <coughs> joules of potential energy would I have? 5,000. Okay. So it, it, maybe it does have some meaning. But people generally don't use this joule per kilogram approach when we talk about mass. So it's, it's hard to really connect it to a, an analogy because we've never heard of, a uh, of massive potential or something like that. Mass potential isn't something we typically use. We just talk about gravitational potential energy. But mass potential could have some validity. Maybe it could. Nobody uses it. Well, maybe there is somebody, but we don't talk about it. This would be called mass potential, or the amount of potential per unit of mass. But we don't really use it. What would you call this guy? You could call it charge potential. Charge potential would be a nice, valid term. People don't usually call it charge potential. They usually call it electric potential, just to be confusion, confusing, I think. Electric or electrical potential. So here, here's the issue with the vocabulary. I just want to address the vocabulary issue first, OK? What do we call this equation? Oh, sorry, I didn't do my notation right. There should have been a Q2 there. What do, what do we call the, the equation E equals K Q1 Q2 over R? Yeah, electrical potential energy. This is electrical potential energy. That's great. This is electrical potential. Can you see where the confusion might happen with the vocabulary? This is electrical potential energy. This is electrical potential. This one talks about how much energy there is, potential energy there is between two charges. This one here talks about how much electric potential energy there is per charge that's 
in the presence of other charges. It's not the name that we called it, so we kind of have to go with it. So you're going to see those two terms, and you need to be able to differentiate between the two, okay? <coughs>